We have talked about receptor tyrosine kinases. We said that when they bind their ligand, two of them come together, they dimerize, they cross phosphorylate each other. When they cross phosphorylate each other, they create domains or scaffold structures that can be recognized by other molecules in the cytoplasm. These molecules bind the receptors, phosphorylated receptors, and can either be activated directly or they serve as scaffold proteins and they recruit other proteins and they, the scaffold proteins themselves don't get activated but when they recruit other proteins that results in activation of those proteins. The example we talked about was GERB and SOS protein that gets GERB binds the receptor, it recruits SOS and it activates it. Now we are going to talk about an enzyme that binds these receptors, receptor tyrosine kinases, becomes activated. This receptor has a kinase activity, meaning that it attaches a phosphate group to its substrate. In this case, the substrate is not a protein, it is actually a lipid molecule. Let's look at this enzyme, how it works. PI3 kinase, phosphotidyl inositol 3 kinase. The number 3 is there because it attaches a phosphate group at carbon number 3 on phosphotidyl inositol. So here this is a reaction catalyzed by PI3 kinase and it results in addition of a phosphate group at carbon atom number 3 as you can see on the screen. These molecules can also be cleaved which are cleaved by PLC, phospholipase C. There are two different versions of that. We will talk about that later. So these molecules can be cleaved and we can generate inositol triphosphate or bisphosphate and DAG. Inositol triphosphate, we have said, can bind calcium channels on the membrane of ER and release calcium ions influx of calcium can thereby also activate other proteins that we have previously talked about. These structures right here that I am pointing out, these structures also serve as scaffolds to which other proteins can bind and become activated. We will look at the example of that. The proteins that bind the structure, phosphotidyl inositol triphosphate, these proteins have a specific domain, a sequence of amino acid residues inside the protein, which is called plexin homology or pH domain. Plexin is a protein which is present in platelet cells. Platelets are small fragments of cells in our blood that help us clot the wound when we have an injury. There are two types of PLCs. PLC beta, for example, we saw is activated by G protein coupled receptors or G protein linked receptors. PLC gamma on the other hand is activated by receptor tyrosine kinases. There are about 200 proteins that have plexin homology domain which can bind these molecules and get activated. Let's look at how this enzyme works. Here's our PI3 kinase. It is in this case the cell is a B cell we know B cells secrete antibodies which help us defend ourselves against pathogens. When B cell receptor gets activated, it attaches, there's a phosphate group addition to this receptor, cytoplasmic domain of this receptor. This helps PI3 kinase to interact with this receptor. PI3 kinase becomes activated. It phosphorylates its substrate, in this case, it's phosphotidyl inositol bisphosphate because it already has two phosphates. We have said PI3 kinase attaches phosphate group at carbon atom number 3 which is right here. So when antigen receptors or B cell receptors are activated, PI3 kinase is activated resulting in inositol lipid docking sites which can recruit two molecules BTK and PLC gamma. To the cytoplasmic phase of the plasma membrane. So let's look at these molecules. 
BTK stands for Burton's tyrosine kinase, which has a plexin homology or pH domain that can bind phosphatidyl inositol triphosphate. Also, another molecule, PLC gamma, also has this domain. This can also bind another different molecule of PI3, PIP3. When BTK binds PIP3, it becomes activated. It's a kinase. It phosphorylates PLC gamma. PLC gamma, now remember, is also attached at the cytoplasmic phase of the plasma membrane. Basically, the, the purpose of this exercise is to bring these two molecules in close vicinity of each other. When these two molecules are in close contact with each other, one of them, BTK, phosphorylates PK, PLC, and PLC, when is activated, it can cleave a different molecule of phosphatidyl inositol triphosphate, resulting in release of inositol triphosphate and diisoglycerol, or DAG, we have said. So DAG can also serve as a structure to which other proteins, other molecules can bind and become activated. IP3, we have said, can bind receptors on the endoplasmic, uh, endoplasmic reticulum. These are ion channel receptors which open up as response and there's an influx of calcium inside the cell. I would like to also mention here that BTK is basically Burton's tyrosine kinase. This kinase is coded by a protein present on X chromosome and if there's a mutation in this protein, you can well imagine the B cell receptor, if it is getting a signal and it's not being conveyed to the rest of the cellular machinery, it will result in inactive, inactive B cells already, although the B cell has received a signal, it cannot do its job. So basically, people who have mutation in this gene have inability to produce antibodies. And this is called agammoglobinemia, and this is an excellent disorder. So here we have seen an example of PI3 kinase getting activated by receptor tyrosine kinases, which in turn gives, provides signal to B cell to produce antibodies.